I was not on our radar at all. And it was really that I was starting to get burnt out even in my own business. The business was growing. I had finally outpaced my corporate salary and I felt again, kind of topped out in growing the business, minding my family, the kids, the husband, having time for myself, etc. And so I started reading a lot, honestly, about how people get out of that trading time for money. So that was really the first time I started reading a lot from the FIRE community just about this notion of untethering from a traditional job or from you know, time for money of any kind. So I, we thought about fire in stages. There's Costa Rica fire, which is why our blog is called that, where we could have gotten there sooner if we were, if it was just the two of us and we were living in Costa Rica. So that's always a fallback plan. Then there's Jacksonville fire, which is still living in the US, but living in a cheaper geography. And then there's New York City fire. So we could not, be working part-time and relying on our real estate income if we were still living a New York lifestyle and carrying a New York apartment and all of the expenses that come with New York. I don't think, I think the, this rule of thumb around, oh, the stock market has returned 7% year on year. I, I don't think you can plan on that. We've seen how volatile inflation can be. So I, I feel like a lot of these rules of thumb that I actually grew up with in the last few decades don't hold water. So I'm, yeah, I'm still thinking of, of Costa Rica as, yep, we could retire there right now. And that's what we're planning on doing. And then we'll run the numbers again at 60, at 70, at 80, at nine. We'll make the decision year on year based on where we are and not some rule of thumb, 4%, 7%, 10%, or whatever. Welcome to Catching Up to Fi, a podcast on mindset, money, and life for late starters of any age on their journey to financial independence. I'm Bill, and I'm a late starter. I'm Becky, and I'm also a late starter, and we're your hosts. We're here to help you with your journey to financial independence, no matter where you're starting from. We're going to talk to experts, other late starters, and explore topics related to our mission. Join us as we catch up to Fi together. Hello, and welcome back to Catching Up to Fi. I'm Bill Yount with my co-host, Becky Heptig, and we have an exciting guest today. It's a story. One of our community members who reached out to us from the Late Starter Fire community. She found her way, much like us, and muddled through with a path that escalated to Fi with a multiple stream of income approach. Caroline Levine is one half of Costa Rica Fire. She and her husband, Scott, the other half, both grew up in New York City and have been married for 29 years. In their 20s and 30s, financial independence and early retirement were not at all on Scott and Caroline's radar. They were focused on their jobs and raising their kids in New York City, but also starting to invest in real estate. After focusing on fire in their 40s, Scott and Caroline were both able to leave their corporate jobs, and now in their 50s, they are empty nesters, traveling and splitting their time between New York, Jacksonville, and Tamarindo, Costa Rica. There is a lot more to Caroline's story, and that's what we'll be hearing today. So let's dive right in. Caroline, welcome to Catching Up to Fire. Well, thanks so much for having me. We're excited to talk to you today, Caroline, because there's so much in your story, and I think there's a, a lot of nuggets that our audience is going to really be able to attach to and, and take away some, some actionable tips. So let's start by just give us just a quick background of your, where you grew up or your money stories sure. or whatever you'd like to share with us. Yeah, sure. So I grew up in New York City, New York. I actually, fun fact, didn't get my driver's license until I was 50 years old because I was in Manhattan where you don't need to drive. And I went to college up at Barnard College, Columbia University. You don't need to drive. So I just never did. And I did not come from a family of entrepreneurs or anybody who is looking to be financially independent and retire early by any stretch of the imagination. So I grew up with the very traditional, get good grades, got a good job, work for 40 years, and then retire in your 60s. That was always what I had planned to do. And in my case, I 
was a music and economics double major. I started in management consulting and financial services. I moved into recruiting and HR. And so I had pretty regular jobs up until I was in my mid thirties. And I had two kids at that point and working even a regular corporate job. I, I had decent hours, but it's still pretty all consuming. New York City is very much a hustle culture. And I just didn't feel like I could sustain full-time in-house corporate work and raising kids and still stay married, honestly, and and be family-minded and have any time for myself. So I knew that I wasn't long for that kind of life. And so I ended up being an independent consultant. I was 36 when I launched that business. And it was based around what I had already known. So I was in human resources at the time in recruiting. And so I started a business doing career coaching. So it's very much related and doing some recruiting projects. And when I say that fire was not on our radar, I mean, that was very much the case that I really had anticipated that the consulting that I was doing was a lifestyle play to better balance work and life. And that was what I was planning to do. My husband was working in IT for a nonprofit at the time and had intended to stay there. Again, FI was not on our radar at all. And it was really that I was starting to get burnt out even in my own business. The business was growing. I had finally outpaced my corporate salary. And I felt, again, kind of topped out in growing the business, minding my family, the kids, the husband, having time for myself, et cetera. And so I started reading a lot, honestly, about how people get out of that trading time for money. So that was really the first time I started reading a lot from the FIRE community just about this notion of untethering from a traditional job or from you know time for money of any kind. And so planted a seed in my head at this point, I was turning 40, natural inflection point. So my business was topping out. I'm in that kind of midlife crisis, if you want to call it that. I'm reading all of these new ideas. And I started to think to myself, maybe this could be us where we can untether from the time for money trade. And I started exploring different ways to do that. And one of the most obvious ways, because I was a consultant that everyone advises you, it's productize your services, right? So if you have a knowledge business, you can record your stuff and you can sell videos and audios. And it's so easy to launch these online courses. It is not that easy. I did it for many years, really trying different things to scale my consulting business. And while I still do products, what I ended up doing instead of scaling the consulting was actually something different altogether, which was getting into real estate. So it was something that I enjoyed reading about and researching. It was something my husband actually enjoyed reading about and researching. And so we ended up funneling whatever extra money we could into rental properties. And that was a way of untethering from time for money. It wasn't actually about either of our careers being the engine uh, to doing that. So I'll pause here because I know that I said a lot. <laughs> That's okay. And in your journey, one of the things we find is that people's money stories include sort of ignorance to financial literacy and a focus on spending as opposed to saving. Were you a natural saver? Did that, did you start your journey with like, let's max out the 401k, let's do all the right things until you wanted to untether? Yeah. So we were both natural savers. So we had a leg up in that way, and that both Scott and me are, we are, we're what I would say, good with money in terms of good habits. We don't spend a lot, though we lived in New York City, which is a very expensive geography, regardless of how you do it. You can't clip your coupons out of, of New York City. Like you really have to have to make a certain amount of money and you have to spend a certain amount of money. There's just a, a limit to how much you can cut. But what I will say was difficult about our money journey, which might resonate with some of your 
listeners is that I think I was so invested in some of the rules of thumb about money, things like max out your 401k and watch your latte factor and some of these rules of thumb that people have and debt is bad. We actually were able to build our real estate portfolio because of debt. There's no way that we could have bought. We have at this point 10 properties. We have mortgages on half of these properties. There's no way that we could have amass the portfolio that we have without embracing debt. And for a long time, I was actually really, really afraid of it. And it slowed us down in that way. And so I think that you can be good with money in terms of what the general mass media thinks is good with money. And it still won't be enough necessarily. Because I think if you are trying to reach financial independence, if you haven't thought about it until later in life, you can't do what the everyday person does because the everyday advice is built on working for four decades and making a certain amount of money. And and, and so that just wasn't going to be us. Once we decided we're not going to be working for 40 years in traditional jobs, we had to do something different. Caroline, I'm curious, what were the resources that spurred you on? You said that you read quite a bit. You consumed content when you first found the FI idea. And also, that's what spurred you on into real estate. What were some of those? So I've always been reading a lot of personal development books. That includes personal finance. That includes life coaching books. I will tell you now, so I, I can't tell you where exactly I discovered the word the acronym FIRE, like who are my first FIRE blogs that I read, but I'll tell you what I read now. I I follow Financial Mentor, who I think is great. Financial Samurai, I also think is a very, very strong writer. Bigger Pockets for real estate was a big, big resource. I would say that the most inspiring thing that I read was, and I still follow their content, they're a publishing company called International Living that started with a magazine and now has an entire media operation all around digital nomad and and really international living is about retiring abroad. So it's about, and it's specifically about retiring abroad on your social security. And so it appealed to me because I am not a luxury traveler. I'm very much about comfort and security for sure, but I I don't, I'm not going to read Condé Nast Traveler. When I read CN Traveler, I'm like, oh my God, I would never stay at these places. But international living was something that I could wrap my arms around. They talk about different geographies where where you can go far living on two to three thousand dollars. And that really appealed to me because it just stretched my idea about what was possible. Remember that I was in New York City at the time that I was consuming all this content, where in New York City, you can barely rent an apartment for two to $3,000 a month. So the notion of being able to live with all of your monthly expenses covered, that was just a daring and very new idea. And it just forced me to confront a lot of my assumptions. Am I going to stay in New York for the rest of my life? So, so that was probably the thing that really forced me to think different. So you accumulated paper assets in your 20s, and you did all the right things for paper assets. That can be a bit of a longer path to FI, yes. as we know. Did you accumulate a war chest outside of that, anticipating jumping into real estate? That first deal can be yes. so hard from a capital standpoint. Tell us how you prepared for that and then launched into that first deal. Yeah. So not only did we not accumulate a war chest, the, the one thing if I could do it over again was, again, so I'm consuming a lot of traditional money advice, max out your 401k, you know, and of course we're in this high tax city. New York City has very high taxes in addition to the state taxes and of course the federal taxes. So so we were maxing out both of our 401ks and keeping very, very little, if not like really nothing outside of our retirement accounts. And of course, you can't tap your retirement accounts till you're 59 and a half without penalty. And so when we did think about growing the real estate portfolio, it was really only when my side of the business, my my husband was at that point working a traditional 
corporate job. So when my business started to, to throw off profits, that was when before putting it into a, let's say, solo 401k or another retirement vehicle was like, whoa, we have money that we can put into real estate. But our first real estate deal was actually in, in our 30s because we were renting in Manhattan with really no expectation that we would ever be able to buy <laughs> because Manhattan real estate, you can just Google it, is incredibly expensive. You can have a, a, a terrible one bedroom apartment and it's going to go for close to a million dollars. I mean, it is just, it is so expensive. And we just never thought that we could afford, or even if we could afford to throw a million dollars on something, uh, we would not do it on a fourth floor walk up that was too tiny for a family of four anyway. So, I mean, just buying in Manhattan just seemed like it was so out of reach for, for regular people that we started looking at the outskirts and we ended up buying a place in Monmouth County, New Jersey that we could use on the weekends that we potentially might move our family to if we decided to live that suburban lifestyle. So at that point, we had one small child and the thinking was, hey, we might want to to move there. We we never did. We just loved the city. And so we always used it as a weekend place. But as real estate does, it appreciates. And we had put our traditional 20% down and then it appreciated. And so we were able to take out a home equity line of credit, which was what we used as a down payment for our first rental property. And so we bought a couple of rental properties still in our 30s, thinking it would be diversification for when we retired. So this was not at all planning on using it for income right now. It wouldn't have been enough income for financial independence for sure, because our first couple of rentals were just break even. The thinking was in 30 years, they would pay off, our tenants would pay off these rentals. And then we would we bought our first rentals in Asheville, North Carolina. We were thinking maybe we would retire in Asheville or maybe we would continue renting those out and it would be like an extra social security payment. So that was all that we were thinking about in terms of, of real estate. And it was only when reading some of the fire blogs and then also international living and just thinking more out of the box around, hey, could we live differently? It was that was well into our 40s when we started thinking, oh, if we had more real estate, if we had things outside of our retirement accounts, if we could drop our expenses a little bit, like international living, where they say, oh, go to a, a less expensive geography and that might help you. Like all of those seeds came together and it became maybe we could do this sooner than our 60s. And indeed, we ended up doing it in our, our late 40s, early 50s. What time, I mean, what year did you start all this with regards to the ease of acquiring properties? What, what era are we talking about? So we acquired our first, so our first property was when we were 31. That was the property that we're using just as a weekend place. So we were not renting that out. It then appreciated within five years, we were able to take a home equity line and buy our first two rentals that we have. That was 35, 36, ages 35, 36. Again, using that as our diversification from our paper assets. So that's still just break even. We're not throwing off any income from that. And then it was when I turned 40, I'm four years into my business thinking about maybe we want to do something different with the financial independence. We didn't buy any real estate at that point. We didn't have any cash to buy real estate at that point. We still have two properties that are not necessarily throwing off cash. We still have all of our assets in retirement accounts that we can't touch until we're 59 and a half. My business is starting to outpace, had outpaced my corporate salary and to think about how can I expand this? I'm getting into audio and video products that are taking up a lot of my time and not making me happy at all and really throwing, not making me feel like I'm trading, I'm saving uh, time and making money. And so I started thinking again about real estate. And so once we got to, we bought our third 
rental property and then started to buy year on year when we were 42, 42, 43, 44, 45 is when we started adding properties. We got as high as 15 properties. We sold five of them right before the pandemic, not because we knew the pandemic was happening, but because we were in a geography, Indianapolis, that we ended up not really wanting to be in. It was, we didn't have a great team on the ground. It was harder to rent stuff. It just was Financial Mentor, which I mentioned the site, he talks about return on headache, right? Like it just was, it was not the return that we wanted. And so we ended up selling those properties. So we are net 10 properties at this point. So that was all in the, when we were 42 to 47, 48, we amassed all of our net properties. Caroline, I have so many questions. <laughs> so okay. when... When was this in terms of calendar years? Did you start this before the 08 housing crash or after? No, this was after. So this is 2013, 14, 15, 16, okay. and 17 was okay. when we bought a lot of our properties. Yeah. So we could have bought a heck of a whole lot more if we were going to do it right. We called it right at the bottom. But that's part of us being really conservative is that I, I don't know. I don't think I'm smart enough to call the bottom or to call the very top. And so we were in geographies where we could see. So Asheville at that point was already too expensive. So we bought in Asheville, like I said, not for FI purposes, but for diversification purposes. That was in 2006 and seven. So in 2013 to 17, we were looking at Northeast for Jacksonville, Florida, which is where we are now living with a similar strategy to Asheville. So we're going to buy rental. So we are either going to keep renting or that we can move into if we decide to retire there. And at that point that we were buying in Jacksonville, that was also when I was already thinking about having read International Living, possibly living in another location. At that point, my work was virtual enough and it was just getting my husband on board about making his work more virtual. So that was part of the plan was I was planting seeds around, hey, if you could somehow untether from your job, we could both be location independent and we wouldn't have to necessarily be in New York. At that point, our youngest was in high school and college age was really, really close. And so we knew by 2019, geographically, we could be somewhere else. And so between 2013 and 2019, it was putting it all together regarding to increase the real estate, to have additional income that's outside of our retirement accounts, and then also moving to a cheaper location, in this case, Jacksonville, Florida, making the numbers work. So I, we thought about fire in stages. There's mm -hmm. Costa Rica fire, which is why our blog is called that, where we could have gotten there sooner if we were, if it was just the two of us and we were living in Costa Rica. So that's always a fallback plan. Then there's Jacksonville fire, which is still living in the US, but living in a cheaper geography. And then there's New York City fire. So we could not be working part-time and relying on our real estate income if we were still living a New York lifestyle and carrying a New York apartment and all of the expenses that come with New York. New York is a far more expensive geography than Northeast Florida. So San Francisco property, would be similar, et cetera. Your first property, you saved up 20,000 for, what was it 20,000 or 20%? It was, it was 20%. So the first property, so you mean the one that we're living at, a, I mean, that we're using on the weekends? Yeah, so we saved up fifty thousand dollars for that first property. Okay, and then you leveraged into debt. Take us through your leverage journey and how that worked, because that's ultimately how you escalated things. And to me, that's very intimidating. Going past that first twenty percent, and you took out the HELOC, and then you rolled it into your Asheville properties. Can you take us through? that leverage journey using the capital appreciation of your first property in order to, to start acquiring more properties? It sounds like it was about five years before the equity had increased to the point where you bought two properties in Asheville. 
Uh, yeah, because keep in mind was that, that, a, was that again was that again twenty percent down, or did you do something else? No, no, no. It was twenty percent down because we. It wasn't like we had a track record as real estate investors or anything, and because it was going to be a rental property, we already had a mortgage somewhere else. I'm trying to think if we were able to get. 20% down, or if we had to even do 25% down. This was at a time where now there's so many of these like commercial lending and private lending outfits. It's almost easier to find private money for things. That was not a thing, or at least I didn't know about it, certainly in 2006 and seven when we were investing in our first rentals. So we were doing our straight through a mortgage broker, hey, we're going to buy this as a rental. And so it was still pretty strict regarding getting documentation and things like that. But we both had incomes, full-time incomes. And Scott had a corporate job where he had a long history of pay stubs. So he was a very safe bet in that way. And we bought properties that were small enough that if they were vacant for one, two, three, four, five, six months, we could carry it. We never overextended ourselves to the extent that if something really went wrong, we wouldn't be able to carry for a while. And again, that's being, that's us being conservative saying, hey, what if someone doesn't rent the property or it needs more work than we anticipated. And that's why we bought two and then we didn't buy anything because we couldn't carry additional, if worse came to worse, we couldn't carry additional properties. So we did nothing for years and years and years because I didn't want to leverage up against our, our rental properties. I think people can do it faster if they embrace debt sooner, but you're talking to someone who had a lot of beliefs around traditional money management, whose first money teachers were people like Susie Ormond, right? Who's very much like, oh my God, you know, like don't spend money on anything, right? So I was like, oh, I can't afford that. It wasn't until, so in 2013, so now we have a lot of time here too, right? To build up even additional equity in our properties. And you had the the crash in 2008. And so some of the properties that we bought were under $100,000 that you can end up renting out. So, so what we paid for a down payment for our first property could buy almost a property outright in Northeast Florida post the 2008 crash. So it's a combination of being more willing to embrace debt, having some capital appreciation, having my independent business throwing off some cash, right? That we're then reinvesting instead of traditional paper assets and instead of our retirement accounts right into the real estate and being okay with using debt for the rest. For we currently have over $800,000 of mortgage debt. If you told me, and we are both working part-time, and if we don't sell a project, like that money goes away, right? If you had told me 10 years ago, even, that you, I would have almost a million dollars in debt, I would be like, that's really irresponsible. <laughs> because I was very much of that mindset around, like, do not, over leverage yourself and what's going to happen, this, that, and the other thing. But because we we did it over time and we have a track record of rental properties now, and we can see how long vacancies take and what things actually cost and who's a good property manager and how to manage our property managers. I just became, we just became more comfortable about amassing that debt. And so you're talking about a journey from buying our first property in 2000, in 2002, I said, I said 2012 for us, actually 2002 was the property that we were using to our first rental in six and seven to then like a big 
a big spurt from 2013 to 17. So that's like a total, that's like a 15 year journey to get there. And we're still like learning and we're still doing different things. So it's not overnight, but it's still, I think, faster than people think. And and people can do it faster than we did. Like I said, I'm very conservative and it just took me a while to get comfortable with certain things. I have to admit that uh, the debt would sort of twist my stomach up a little bit also. So when you bought the the first rentals that you had, which were the two in Asheville, so did the down payment for those come from a HELOC on the weekend home? Yes. Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure I had that straight. Okay. Yeah, your, because if we had your... waited till we if we had waited till we had free cash, that's the thing is that we we didn't have savings outside of our retirement accounts. And our retirement accounts were traditional accounts, they're 401ks attached to companies that don't let you do fancy fancy free stuff with them, buying like real estate in them in the vanguards and the fidelities of the world. So they're very, very traditional. And and I always thought, oh my goodness, you have to like save up all this money to put 20% down. Like that would have taken really forever. So we we have our our HELOC. So it's just again getting comfortable with like using leverage. Did you just roll the HELOCs from property to property and roll the equity into the next property? So we had the HELOC on the first one, and then we would pay it we would pay it down before buying again. So there, that's hence the gap between 2006 and seven and 2013, 14, 15, right? Because the thing about a HELOC, I don't know that people know it's, yes, it's based on the equity in your house, but it's also based on the bank's bet that you're going to pay it off. At the end of the day, it's best, it's really based on your income. If you don't have a job, even if you have all the equity in the world in your house, you're not going to be able to borrow against it because the bank is going to want to be able to be paid back other than by selling your house. So the HELOC was there, yes, because we had equity in the house, but also because we still had income. So it never outpaced our ability to earn. And it was only... so. So we had to like pay that down and then kind of build up that that buffer again. And then we had the 2008 crash. Prices go down. We're looking at a cheaper geography. That's why we didn't continue to buy in Asheville. We're back to a cheaper geography where we're looking at properties that our, our cheapest one is $70,000. And, and it's a three-bedroom, two-bath condo that ends up renting for $1,200. So you're not going to get those numbers in a lot of geographies in, in just any market. So it's a combination of just looking for the right, the right properties, the right places, and the money, et cetera. So what was your niche, actually? What was the niche that you chose to pursue? And did you stay in that niche in your wheelhouse, or did you move outside of that? So our niche was single family. We did houses and we did condos. We do have one duplex, but we never looked at apartment buildings. We didn't look at commercial real estate. We have one vacation rental. That's our Costa Rica property because it makes more sense as a vacation rental, but we did not look at vacation rentals, let's say in the US. So in a way, yes, we stayed pretty committed to our original niche was single family. And the idea behind single family, the reason why we chose it to start was because it's the easiest place to start. You buy one property at a time. If you have to divest it, you can sell one off at a time. You don't have to do commercial lending, which is an entirely different process. So it was something that we could jump in as sideline investors and still be okay going going slowly so what was your niche and your price point was in order to make the numbers work where did you stay in price point so we stayed i mean our sweet spot is is between a hundred what 70 was obviously like a, a really really great deal so 70 to 150 was where we were 
really looking. So our first two properties, rental properties in Asheville were $150,000. Again, this is 2006 and 2007. By 2013, when we're ready to buy again, like there, we couldn't buy anything in that price point there. So we, and we also didn't want to be all in one geography. So we were looking at different geographies. And Jacksonville came on our radar at a recommendation of our friend. And then we visited and we really liked it. And it was one of these places, we loved the beach. It was one of these places where, yes, we could see that the rental numbers would work and we could possibly also use it ourselves. And so we were at that point where 2019 is not that far away. We started thinking, oh, we don't have to be tethered to New York. So there were other reasons for looking. And so that's how we settled on that area. You mentioned that a couple of times that your husband, Scott, was was obviously doing this with you and that he sort of came along. Can you give us just a, a quick uh, picture of how did this work together? Were y'all working together on this all the time or did you have different ideas about what needed to happen? So... I would say that right now we're definitely working hand in hand. And in fact, he does a lot more of the on the ground real estate stuff, managing our property managers, being on site. If something needs to be fixed up, he runs our numbers. He he does all of that. Uh, I'm thinking about what might be next. I'm scouting for things. I'm pitching different ideas. In the beginning, um, because in the beginning, it's about scouting and pitching so it was just me. He's. We both were pretty traditional in the sense of get good grades, get a good job, like retire in 40 years. I broke out of that mold a lot faster than he did just by virtue of, one, I think I had the prompt of rightly or wrongly. I think that when it comes to working parents, moms have second and third shift always. So it just was it was definitely in my face more that it was very difficult to have a traditional corporate career uh, without doing something alternative or different if I wanted to have my sanity and have time with the family. So I had to come to that conclusion faster just by necessity. And in, in that journey, that was what sparked all of the other stuff. I also, just by virtue of being the reader of the personal finance stuff and the discoverer also came to all of these things faster. So I was constantly talking about, oh, I read this and I read that. And it wasn't that he said, no, 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 you know, we're not doing that. It was more like, oh, I don't know. And I, what about this? What about that? But at the same time, he was always willing to look. And so we, we would scout out geographies, we would run numbers together. And one of the things that I tell spouses about when you disagree is, well, find something that you agree on and build from there. So one of the things that he always liked doing, even when he wasn't the investor, was tracking the numbers. So in the initially, even when we remember, we started dating like right out of high school. I went to the prom together. So even in our first jobs out of college, I was the one who was like, we're maxing out our 401ks. We're doing all the, the traditional advice. And he was like, oh. I mean, he just hadn't thought about it. Right. And he just did it begrudgingly because the, the, he's nice that way. We're, we have a good relationship that way, but he would be tracking the numbers. And over time, he would see that these little, what seemed like little investments would grow. And so he started to get into it just by virtue of, of seeing it. And then when I started pitching other ideas, they didn't seem so outlandish anymore until finally we're now like completely on the same page. But yeah, I mean, it was always a process. Like I became a consultant first. It took years, uh, 10 years after I was a consultant for him to, to do the same thing. And I was planting that seed for years before he ultimately did it. So so everyone goes on their own journey, even within like a couple, as close as we are. I feel like we are very, very close, but everybody has their own pace and their own learning journey. But luckily, again, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So even though it took us a while, we still got there. So you said you scouted locations and you did the research, it sounds like yourself, but with some advice from friends. 
How did you find the properties? How did you narrow down the niche to a granular place where these numbers work? And then also as a secondary question, give us the back of the napkin approach that you had to vetting a deal. Sure. So in terms of scouting locations, I am thinking about selfishly enough, where do I want to spend some time? Because we're going to have to visit there. We're going to have to go there. So it starts with that. So there. Are, so we're living in New York. I'm not looking essentially west of the Mississippi right now because it's just way too far, right? We're thinking about things that uh, are a short flight or potentially like a day's drive or, or something like that. I don't recommend driving to Jacksonville in a day, but it's doable if you really, really had to get there. So I, I that's like the, the the first pass. But I'm also just by virtue of being a personal finance reader, I'm constantly reading about different markets around the country. So I'm looking at the U.S. only at this point. I'm looking at east of the Mississippi because it's places that we want to be. And I'm constantly reading about what economies are doing well and what aren't doing well. And the thing about Asheville was that it was on a lot of lists, best places to retire, that like vibrant small town. It's just there were just a lot of things that kept coming up on the radar. Jacksonville is actually similar that way. So Florida was on our radar for that reason. And the first geography that that actually I picked just from secondary research was Sarasota, Florida. So Sarasota was on a lot of lists around good economy, varied economy, a place to retire, a place to visit. The problem with Sarasota was that it was expensive. I couldn't get the numbers to work to buy a place that would cash flow entirely from the rent. And I was too afraid to have to carry it month to, to go negative month to month. Some people might not have been, and we would have been out ahead had we just jumped in and bought it because they had an incredible appreciation. But again, that's part of being like super conservative is once I picked a geography, then it's looking at what are the costs of real estate there. And you don't have to be on the ground to look at that. Now it's so easy with things like Zillow. You can you can just look at listings. You can you can make relationships with real estate agents online and just ask them to send you listings. So I was already looking at a number of different properties. The other thing about picking a geography was that we knew we wouldn't be on the ground. So from day one, we would need to have a property manager there. And so part of it was where did we feel comfortable that we could have a team in place? And Asheville came bubbling up to the surface because a friend of mine from a few years back at that point had actually moved there and was dating someone in construction. So I thought, oh, the stars are aligned here. This is a geography that has come to my attention. The numbers work. And I have someone who's on the ground that I trust who can make introductions for us. And I feel like we could build a team. As it turned out, she ended up divorcing this person. So it wasn't like we had this person on the ground. She ended up moving out of Asheville. The people she introduced us to, we ended up firing and putting into place other people. But it did give us a start, right? And so it's always a work in progress. But that was how we, we ultimately settled on that geography. What back of the napkin numbers did you use to vet a property? You had your range, you had your niche, you had a broker on the ground, you were researching properties through Zillow as well. This is a, a lot of time, a lot of energy, and there is sort of a return on hassle factor. In order to minimize the return on hassle factor, you had to put together a team. But tell us the back of the napkin numbers that helped you vet a deal before you visited the area so you could really focus it on looking at a few properties. And then did you use that time also to vet a team and what kind of team do you need? Yeah. So in terms of the back of the napkin for the first couple of properties, we were looking at break even. We weren't looking at an ROI because our goal at that point was diversification for our paper assets and for ultimately cash flowing or we would retire there or once we paid off the mortgage. So we wanted to be confident that the, the rental income would cover the mortgage 
HOA, if it's there, was not for these two. But when we were looking at condos, which we were also looking at condos in Asheville, we just didn't get any HOA taxes, insurance, you have to assume that a property is going to be vacant. The real estate rule of thumb was factor in one or two months. It can take actually a lot longer. So I later on raised that factor. But at the time I was like, oh, okay, if I took out one to two months, the listing fee is one month uh, typically, because again, we're not managing the property and finding the tenant directly. And then property management is anywhere from eight to 12%. It was 10% where we were looking. So that's a cost in advance. And then there are expenses around maintenance, right? If but So we know in advance how much life a roof has left or plumbing, electric, are there any things that need to get done? And obviously those numbers became more solid over time. But in the beginning, we were using things that we read. It's like factor in an additional 10 to 15% for capital expenditures, which actually sometimes it's too high, sometimes it's too low. So again, we have more experience now having looked at a lot more properties and then also having more rentals and more years of renting under our belt. But at the time we were just going by numbers that we read about through things like bigger pockets and other real estate sites. And then, and then looking at, okay, so then if we bought putting this much down, I mean, there's so many mortgage calculators out there, right? So this is what the monthly mortgage is going to be. They're going to be, you know, what insurance is, you just need to call an agent, or you can just kind of Google that for the range, property management. So there, are, you, you can run like a lot of these numbers. And for us, we just wanted to have all of that be at least zero and ideally hundred or $200 more, because in case we're, we're off, we, we don't want to be too far off. And then in the back of my mind, I'm not budgeting for this every month. If the proverbial hits the fan, and it's vacant, can we month to month cover that mortgage? Because a tenant's not going to be paying for that. And yes, we, we could do that. And so that was when we would pull the trigger on that. So that's the numbers part. So it sounds like you were in sort of the value add market, sort of a class B, you weren't doing turnkey, you weren't doing class C per se. And can you tell our audience what value add means? Because you did have capital expenditures and you obviously had to budget for them. What kind of capital expenditures did you so generally we, look at? Yeah, we didn't do the traditional value add if your listeners are, are re, like, if you're reading bigger pockets or some real estate sites, value add is when you have a property that's in need of renovation or you do something to add that you'll add a room, you'll add a bathroom, you'll upgrade. So when I talked about capital expenditures, I meant replacing a roof if the roof like needs to be replaced. I'm not actively looking for a damaged property or so in fact, we are not because we're not on the ground and because neither of us are either engineers, architects, interior designers, or some other competitive advantage to improving a property, our properties were pretty moving except for cosmetic things. But we're budgeting for CapEx over time because at the end of the day, you can have roofs need to be replaced and plumbing needs to be replaced and ACs need to be replaced. And even the best inspection, like things are going to, things are going to happen. We had mold in the basement because water got in there and that needed to be fixed. So things happen to a, even a property that that's move in. In terms of turnkey, we actually, when we were trying to a real estate portfolio in that 2013 to 17 era, that was when we invested in Indianapolis. And we did use turnkey at that point to find the properties. And that's where the hassle factor was just, uh, I, I'm not very, we are both not very bullish on turnkey because we haven't had the best experience with it. I know maybe there are other people who have. I just firsthand, we have not had a great experience with it. And so we do it the the hard way. <laughs> you know, it's just picking the geography, looking at the listings ourselves, visiting the listings ourselves. In terms of the team, it's a real estate agent who's going to show us places because we are not sending thousands of letters out to owners trying to find the undiscovered properties. We are 
we're doing other things. So we have someone who's, who's looking, so a real estate agent, we have a property manager. Um, the property manager is the person who has contractors. If we need to turn over an apartment or, or, or whatever, we're going to be relying on them. So those are the two most important things. If we need an errand, like we need to have a survey done, or we need to consult a lawyer about XYZ, we're going to tap our real estate agent and our property manager for recommendations, or we're, and we're going to tap just our general business network. But we don't have a standing real estate lawyer or like some very specific other specialists in our different geographies. We have the most important things are the agent and the property manager, and then we farm out from there. So you didn't cash flow initially. It sounds like you reinvested your profits back into the business and you didn't live off any cash flow. When did these properties cash flow for you? And when did your portfolio, where does your portfolio sit today? I mean, how much is paper assets? How much is rental real estate? And are you living off any of this income? So it's 50-50 rental real estate paper assets. We are still both working part-time. And I would say that in terms of our household budget, the rental real estate cash flows enough to cover our residence. So it covers our, our living expenses. I call it house hacking, our mortgage, taxes, insurance. I call it house hacking without someone having to live in your home. The traditional house hacking is, oh, you buy a duplex, you live in one, you live out of the other, or you buy a three bedroom and you live in one bedroom and you rent out the other two or one or two, right? And so, and and that covers your mortgage and taxes and insurance. We are able to get that from our rentals, but all of our rentals are outside of our four walls. So most of our living expenses are still active income. And that's by choice. We could stop working and start drawing on our paper assets, but having lived through the pandemic and how volatile the market is, I don't know that I am willing to do that right now. I think if we ever really, and we both enjoy what we do. So if we can keep doing it part-time, which gives us enough time to, to do things that we love to do, and again, we don't have kids living at home necessarily right now. And so I don't have that grind of, oh my gosh, I'm working 40 hours a week. And then as, as I come home, I've got young kids in the home that need all of this other stuff. It's a very, very different life pace right now being an empty nester. So it, it works for us. I think it's a tricky market right now to be a paper asset investor. And so I just don't, I don't trust my skills of, of divesting in this market. You have a property outside the U.S. in Costa Rica. Can you walk yeah. us through that story? Yeah, so we bought that in 2017. And I wanted to have what I called the nuclear option. So I'm, so 2012, 13 is when I started exploring this international living. That was really well. That's when I discovered that publication. I'm reading about retiring abroad and and the big expense that retiring abroad takes care of is healthcare. That is the one expense in the US that all bets are off. Like there there are just so many stories like the the majority of bankruptcies in the US are medically related and the majority of those bankruptcies are people with insurance. So that just gives you an idea of how messed up our healthcare system is. And so as much as I would run the numbers like really conservatively to cover our health expenses and we buy insurance off the exchange, which costs $2,000 a month for pretty terrible insurance. So let's tell you that right now. So it is a big, big, big expense that you have to, to take care of. And so even though I ran the numbers around having catastrophic insurance, I, I, it was always in the back of my mind, like, oh my gosh, if something happens, like we might have to be abroad to have like, I don't know, just ongoing care or something. And so I, I started just thinking about where might that be? I used international living to scout out 
property to look at locations. Costa Rica came up multiple times, not only in that publication, but interestingly enough, I have a very wide network because of what I do. I'm a career advisor and I worked in HR. So I meet people of all walks of life and I learn their stories. And I kid you not, three very, very different people, a recruiter just like myself, a hedge fund lawyer, and a biotech executive. So three different industries, three different types of people, three different personalities, very different personalities. They had all been to Costa Rica and had all said to me at one time or another, oh my gosh, this is what I imagine if like you could build paradise, like that's, that's what it would be, like something to that effect. Like if you could build the perfect country, that's what it would be. So the bar was super high for me by the time I had visited Costa Rica. We visited for the first time in 2017 and it was like, whoa, it really meets like a lot of our criteria. It's just, we love the beach. So that helps a lot. So it is a, a, a tropical, it has that part of it. It's very affordable. It has universal health care. It doesn't have an army. Instead, they reinvested in their own citizens. So they have a high 90% uh, literacy rate. They have an educated population. They are a net exporter of electricity. So they got this climate change stuff a lot sooner than the rest of us. They've reforested a lot of their their land. Their, a lot of their land is protected, I think over 60%. It might even be a higher percentage. So there are just so many interesting and positive and wonderful things about Costa Rica, and we just really, really enjoy it. So anyway, so I wanted a geography outside of, of the U.S., and the large part was the healthcare piece. But then secondarily, it was also because I didn't know that rental real estate, you can't predict the future. You can never know what the markets are going to do. What if everything froze at the same time? Our government goes to hell, the markets freeze up, the real estate freezes up. If, if, if the economy is really bad, people can't rent. People can't afford to rent. Like everything freezes at the same time. I started thinking, oh, well, we would just leave. We could. We called it our nuclear option. So, so we wanted to buy something that was outside. And Costa Rica ticked off a lot of those boxes. It makes more sense to do it as vacation rental instead of a long term rental, um, because people vacation there. And and then coincidentally, while we were there, we met the right team, someone that we felt like we could trust as a property manager, long time in Costa Rica, but also happened to be American, happened to be an expat who happened to have lived there for over 10 years. And so we don't speak Spanish. I'm learning, but it's slow going. So uh, I certainly don't know enough that I can read contracts or or negotiate in Spanish, right? So I, we needed to have people on the ground for sure. So was this actually in the condo complex that you vacationed in and that's how you met everybody or in the location that you visited where it all sort of rolled from it and there was sort of luck and happenstance involved? Yeah, so we okay, we narrowed it down to two locations. Costa Rica itself is the size of West Virginia, but it has microclimates. There are many different regions. And so you really want to pick where you want to be. So we had narrowed it down to two regions. We visited both of them. It was pretty clear that we wanted one of them. So we focused our energies on that. We bought in a complex that we had not vacationed in, but it is a small enough town. It's walkable from end to end that we we are very familiar with the town staying even in places adjacent to the complex where we ultimately bought. And in terms of meeting the person, the stuff actually happens online. I mean, as soon as we had narrowed it down to Costa Rica, I was just telling everybody, oh, interested in Costa Rica, and I'd love to meet people connected to Costa Rica. And I actually had a social media contact. So someone that I was professionally connected to since met in real life. But at the time, we had only known each other through trading social media posts and things like that. And then she said, oh, I know someone in Costa Rica. And it turned out to be in Tamarindo, which is where we ended up buying. And that person introduced us to other people and it all snowballed from there. So 
it actually didn't start out as specific real estate networking. It was just casting a wide net and saying, hey, I'm trying to talk to as many people as possible. And that one person introduced us to our agent, our property manager, our lawyer, and even some other, other folks there. Are there any logistics that were different or harder from buying real estate in the U.S.? I mean, there are a lot of which of the language is an issue in the sense that you still have to have everything translated because I still recommend that you read everything, even if you trust the person that's reading it for you or explaining it to you. There aren't currency issues in this particular case. That was another reason why we liked Costa Rica. They have their own currency, the Colon, but real estate is conducted in dollars. So we didn't have to worry about currency fluctuations. They have clear title and it's a pretty easy titling process. So that is similar. It's not exactly the same, but so things are not exactly the same. And so you have to know what the rules of engagement are in any country that you're going to be purchasing in. But the, the biggest difference is that it's a vacation rental. The numbers don't work at all to do a long-term rental. And so vacation rental is completely different from renting something long-term. And so the the numbers are different. The property management is more expensive. The turnover is more expensive because people are harder on the property and it, it has to be fully furnished and fully stocked. So you just have a lot more of these ongoing expenses. So you have to be more conservative with your numbers. But again, there were, there were multiple reasons for Costa Rica in particular. It does cash flow for us. But initially, we bought it to pay for itself and as a nuclear first stage of fire for us. So the numbers, the kind of cost-benefit analysis that we did is different than if I'm just looking at a property in the U.S. I find it fascinating that not only is there geo-arbitrage here, but there's longevity insurance and healthcare insurance <laughs> in this option. It's a really unique way to take care of these items that without incurring expense that we see in the United States, and you're comfortable with these elements there. Do you really see yourself taking advantage of this and living permanently outside of the U.S.? Or how does life look like in the future for you? So I don't know. I'm 52. Scott's also 52. So we have a long way to go. In addition to health insurance, I feel like it's a big wild card. There's elder care insurance too. So I grew up in a multi-generational family where the expectation is you take care of your elders. So I've always been thinking about that. Do I want to put that burden on our kids? I do not. That was actually another another reason for me personally. Do I think we're going to, to do it? Maybe. I mean, I feel like the way that our portfolio is moving, we might, if we are 70 years old and need home care right here in the U.S., I don't know, God willing, our portfolio is probably going to hold up to that. But it's such a volatile market right now. I don't think, I think the, this rule of thumb around, oh, the stock market has returned 7% year on year. I, I don't think you can plan on that. We've seen how volatile inflation can be. So I, I feel like a lot of these rules of thumb that I actually grew up with in the last few decades don't hold water. So I'm, yeah, I'm still thinking of, of Costa Rica as, yep, we could retire there right now. And that's what we're planning on doing. And then we'll run the numbers again at 60, at 70, at 80, at night. We'll make the decision year on year based on where we are and not some rule of thumb, 4%, 7%, 10%, like whatever. Okay. Our late starter audience wants to know if they can do it, say at 50 and escalate their path to fire especially in today's market with values and interest rates. What do you think about that idea, that concept? I think you can do it if you're willing to make some hard choices, if you're starting from zero, for example, right? So if you have zero savings, but you have a job, right? How much are you willing to cut your expenses so you can start building up some investment capital? If you have a job that's at all location independent, would you be willing to move to a cheaper geography? And again, our first geo arbitrage was not Costa Rica. It was 
moving to a less expensive part of New York City and then a less expensive part of the US. So you can do geo arbitrage without having to leave the country, but that's one way of doing it. If you can, in New York, for example, it's very common for somebody to have 10, 12, $15,000 a month in living expenses and not be living large. So you can be in an expensive coastal city and have that kind of expense. So if you can cut that down by half, you can save a lot of money in your first year. So it depends on who, who I'm talking to. A lot of the people that I know are, you know, of these coastal cities and they say it's impossible to save. But if you just, if you geo arbitrage and really look at what you're spending, you absolutely can do it. And then it just builds from there. So Caroline, this has been awesome. Our audience had wanted to know about real estate. You've shown that it's possible. You've shown that it's doable and you've shown that it can be a way to go. One of the things that worries me is that you could potentially stop investing in paper assets and flip all your savings into real estate. And that seems like a big risk to me. Would you recommend that to our late starter audience as a way to diversify out of paper assets, but forego the 401k in order to do real estate in this market? Well, again, I'm a conservative investor, so I feel like more diversification is always better than less. I think the tricky part about real estate is that with paper assets, especially if you're working, you might be working in a situation where your employer has offers a 401k plan or offers maybe a match, or maybe it's just easy for you to save and get started there. And that's the most important thing is getting started. So I would worry less about the split between paper and real estate. The other thing about real estate that's potentially dangerous is that it's illiquid. It is much easier to sell your Vanguard or your Fidelity account than it is a single property. And so you have to be thinking about that, that as well. Okay. Well, we're going to wrap it up now because there's a lot more to talk about. There's probably a lot more episodes. Maybe you can be our real estate consultant going forward. We appreciate sure. all that you've given our audience today, but we do have a few lightning round questions that we'd like our audience to understand because nothing's perfect. And you make it sound like, okay, it's a 15 year path. We did it. It's easy. What was your biggest financial mistake, however? I feel like it was holding too tight to traditional advice and not questioning it. So maxing out the 401k and not asking myself, well, what's going to happen if I need that money before 59 and a half, or if I want to reinvest it in some different way. And it just took me such a long time. I mean, I was literally 40. So I had 20 years of just kind of listening to other advice and not just asking myself, is this right for my situation? Are you glad you did it? Yeah, of course. I feel like I couldn't have done it any differently, right? And I feel like everything that I did got me to 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 where I am today. So I don't have I don't have regrets per se, but like I I said earlier, I think it could have been done faster had I had I just questioned kind of traditional advice. Did you have a bad deal, a major catastrophe in the house that dissuaded you from potentially investing further in real estate? Well, we still are open to investing. So nothing has dissuaded us entirely. We we are not looking at any turnkey deals, however. So we are back to to doing everything ourselves. I And it's part of, I think, just thinking there are no shortcuts, really. At the end of the day, I think real estate is tricky enough that you want to be controlling all aspects of the deal and not outsource figuring out what is a good deal to a turnkey company, well-meaning that company might be. So Caroline, what are some of your favorite resources today? You mentioned some of the ones that you started with. So what, what content do you consume or would you suggest today? So I still consume Financial Samurai, fin Samurai, Financial Mentor, International Living. I'm still using Bigger Pockets as a resource. So I think those are evergreen. And then I, I will read books. So one book actually that I read recently that I think might be interesting to your audience, it is not a financial book, but it is called The Risk Paradox. And it's just about 
stories about different people, everyday people who have taken risks, changed careers, started a business, did some unconventional medical thing when they were faced with a diagnosis. So it's, it's just interesting. It just shares how people view risk and they talk about different risk archetypes. And I found that to be fascinating because I consider myself more risk averse. And so it was very helpful just to surround myself with people taking risks, even if it was just through a book. Oh, I love that because I think our audience, since they tend to be older, probably are a little more risk averse. So I, yeah, I, I, I agree. love to check that out. I agree. You are a small but mighty investor. We're probably going to have Coach Carson on the show. He just came out with a new book by that title. And it, when he says small but mighty, he means calculate the number of doors you really need. It's not all go bigger, go bigger, rah, 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 real estate or bust. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. really about what gets me to the life I want to lead, what gets me to my best life, and then hone that. He spent time reducing his leverage. He's down to, I think, 15%. And he's comfortable in this market. He, he, he's not at a point where he needs to lever up. And instead of doing that ongoing, he paid down his mortgages. He did the safer, less math-oriented thing. And you've done that too with downsizing mm -hmm. from 15 to 10 rentals where you're comfortable. And I think that's a big part of real estate is not getting caught up in the hype and getting to the point of comfort. I agree 100%. And I think you always want to be comfortable in any market and know that real estate is, you can't just turn around and sell it. And so I'm always mindful of, I just want to have the things that we are willing to hold for a long time, because you might have to do that in depending on the market. Sure. Well, thank you very much for being here with us today. You've been a joy to talk to. You've had a lot to say that I think will be of extreme benefit to our audience. We look forward to talking to you again. So thank you for being on Catching Up to Fi. Well, thanks for having me. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Catching Up to Five. We would appreciate it if you could leave a five-star review so that our message can reach others. We are not lawyers, financial advisors, accountants, or tax experts. Please consult your own professional advisors before making any important decisions. Our content is for entertainment and education purposes only. We'll see you next time on Catching Up to Five.